So I've been looking forward to the, uh, the reading tonight, and it gives me a lot of pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Herman and welcome him to the uh, Pond House. Herman Arsano is the author of the poetry collection, Glass Bottom Boat, 2007. His poems have appeared widely in such things as the Southern Review, Prairie Schooner, Beloit Poetry Journal, and other national journals. He has essays in the North Dakota Quarterly, Cincinnati Review, Pacific Northwest, and various other venues. He has also published a well-received translation of the poetry of Noni Benegas, one of Spain's leading poets. In 2005, he was awarded a month's residency at Ragdale, the artist colony outside of Chicago. And in 2010, he was awarded the Ogden Poetry Prize by Trinity College in Connecticut. He was born in Newark, New Jersey, so he's from the East. He's a graduate of Trinity College. He's been at the University of Portland since 1979. He got his PhD from the University of Denver in 81, 1981. And his scholarly specialty has been the works and career of the English poet Alexander Pope. So I've, I've had a chance to get to know him to, uh, and meet Herman and talk with him a little bit. So uh, I'm delighted that he's going to be here tonight to read for us. Would you join me in welcoming our poet for the evening, Herman Arsana. Herman. Well, um, thanks for having me, Tom, and the city. Uh, what foresight to have a place like this. And I always think about how lucky we are in Portland, you know, to have such a uh, such a, a literary community, people interested in poetry. I, I was talking to Paul Ann Peterson. We just got through the month-long readings with about celebrating William Stafford's birthday and poetry. And I was at several, and it's so exciting. One of them took my breath away to hear people read his poems so well and to have lived with them and be able to do that. So uh, we are really, really fortunate in Portland to be in that kind of a community and to be able to um, support this and to give to each other in this, in this way. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what I want to do first, can you all hear? Am I projecting? OK. The first thing I want to do is to say that um, I usually start out by reading poems that say something about me, at least metaphorically. I mean, nothing's exactly true. That's kind of a lot of lies, but <laughs> there's truth to it, too. Um, but I also like to read first a poem by somebody who's been part of me in the past. I always think when I'm standing up here that um, really there's a stage full or a, the front of the room is filled with other people with whom I've come here. And uh, I was actually uh, berating myself recently for not writing elegies for so many people that I've lost mm -hmm. and it's I just you know it's just it's gonna have to be my project because there are so many people that I want to um, reach or to recreate in some way uh, but this particular person so I, I usually start by reading a poem by somebody else if it's one of those people and in this case it's a, po a poem by the Connecticut poet Hugh Ogden who was um, well known back east and was my mentor and friend, really a lifelong friend, D died unfortunately in an accident about four or five years ago. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> because it's been kind of warm lately, I thought of doing this and a little bit nice. And uh, this is meant to represent all the people that I'm bringing with me and who are with me as I speak, okay? This one's called Lecture on the Tides. This is by Hugh Ogden and it's from his book Two Roads and This Spring. Lecture on the Tides. This is the point when the earth wobbles and the days lengthen and the years have to have days added. The point when the harness that pulls the sea pulls each of us into spring and makes us shudder again when the first red appears. The bleeding that quicker than not becomes green you will always be here as long as water cuts deeper into soil and the coursing adds to what is left. As long as leaves are drawn out by the tide and buds bleed through the dark. 
Even you who are lost will always be here as long as the moon circles into its line with the sun and the oceans respond, as long as we are able to find the moment when the winds make the globe waver, as long as the earth corrects itself, as long as pain takes faith in its bud and flowers. So, I guess it, he wrote his own elegy. Um, wonderful poet, and I, uh, I recommend him to you. His books are still available on, uh, on um, uh, Amazon and other places electronically. Anyway, um, I look around the room, and I think that it won't seem anachronistic if I begin with a few poems that are all based upon metaphors of film. Do you remember what film is? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I had one of those moments that's, that, besides looking in the mirror every morning when I shave, I had those, one of those moments that, as I was looking together, to gathering poems, that I thought, well, um, I'll have to stop reading these eventually. But <laughs> this poem, um, it also depends upon something else that uh, some of us will remember and other of us won't. And that's a panoramic camera, the kind that would take big groups, like if we were all to stand up in a line, and it would go like this. And I actually have in here, if anybody asks, an explanation of how it works. But it would go like this. And so this depends upon a picture taken that way when I was a boy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's called Panorama. All I've ever wanted is in this panoramic photo with edges curled and yellowed until its ends touch in perfect circle. Dark tube, time telescope, high on the shelf behind me as I write. I pick it up, look in, and see October 1955, my grandparents' 50th, a party in the orchard. Sprawling under sagging apple, crammed with fruit, at least a hundred uncles, cousins, aunts, with Sam and Anna regal in the center. In front of the parents and grandparents, children edge to edge across the ground. I'm there at the very left, cross-legged, just five, transfixed by the magical camera panning left to right, taking in everyone in perfect relation to the other. Swiveling slowly past, the camera tripped some switch in me, like the scent of fox to hound across a field, or now my mind, when what's wild flies past its inward eye and sends me sprinting after to place it on the page. Just so, the camera passed, and I leapt, running wild-hearted behind the standing old ones to the family's other side, then sat on that end, too, cross-legged, cross as the camera continued its slow arc, arrived at its stop in me seconds later. Sleight of hand in black and white. Identical boys. The same smudged shirt, their grin captured exactly for the truest portrait. Subtle, divided self-creation, easily unnoticed. First poem before discovering them in words. There were hundreds in the family. It was a gigantic family. I have 28 first cousins or something like that. So, uh, so don't trust me. <clears throat> um, now, this is another film poem. And you know when you make movies, some of us remember those 8 millimeter movies or even 16 if you really had a fancy camera. But you know... Um, there's a name actually for what ha for the picture, 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 picture. I think it's called a kinema, the kinema, where the word cinema comes from. I remember um, there's a line in a Ezra Pound poem about a, a, a prose kinema or something like. I, I kind of remember that. I think. In any event, um, you need to uh, to know that one. This is a poem called Frozen Frame, and. Uh, um, I kind of have to say this because I'm a teacher, you know, and, and they, people often think you make your students do things you don't do. So we were sitting in class, and I guess for whatever reason, I decided we had to drop what we were doing and write something in class because, you know, sometimes nothing's working, and 
let's do that. And so I just I looked at them in frustration and I said, mm, right, right, right about your mother's kitchen. Because I wanted them to get really um, concrete and everybody remembers his mother's kitchen. I said, or your father's, you know, you know if, if the father did the cooking. And so then I sat there and started to write and um, actually came up with a poem that I liked, you know, so the hell with them, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, don't, don't repeat that, but. So this one's called Frozen Frame, uh, and also there's a, there's a mistake in it. You know how the poet Keats has that poem um, where he talks about stout Cortez looking from oh, Panama, yeah. but it's not Cortez, it's Balboa, you know? So I'm not Keats, and this is not Balboa, but I say that I'm referring to that painting by, um, by uh, Pablo Picasso called Guernica, you know? And you know, um, in the poem it says it's a, a bull whose tongue is sticking out with his mouth open. But I went, it's a horse, right. So I just want you to know, for you fact checkers, that I... <laughs> and the thing is, bull works better because uh, it's of the syllables and in a possessive, so truth had to go. So it's called Frozen Frame. Dry on the edge of the porcelain sink, a square bar of homemade kosher soap alive with lye, white shot through with waves of blue-green iridescence. Left, a dimpled steel two-gallon pot burbles turbulence. A beef tongue thrusts triangular into the air like the gagging bulls in Guernica. From behind, a mother, tense, stretched against the green formica countertop and sink, her left hand about to grasp the nasty soap, her right wrenching him hard, her boy of nine, whose feet dangle from the counter, whose heads whipped back, tongue thrust out for washing. Brackish silhouette against the kitchen window, a single frame of cinema from a full-length sequence, and he as if his older brother, now outside the storm door, frozen with mouth open, incapable of breaking time's blurred plane, not wanting film to whir to life, this stew of tongues and sons, lies and desperate mothers. <laughs> well, you know that thing of looking at your own life that way, that blurred way, you know, um, and I have a great, I mean, my sympathy now is with my mother, really, <laughs> who didn't know what to do with a kid who ruined pictures and other stuff, you know, and said bad things, and so it was awful. This poem is um, another photography poem and um, set in London, and uh, there's a, um, a reference to uh, J.M.W. Turner, the great romantic painter with those wonderful skies, those watercolors, with the amazing English clouds, the kind that when I moved to Portland and I smelled somebody burning coal on Willamette Boulevard and then I had the rain and the clouds, I thought I was in England again and so as I was getting adjusted to living here, I thought, oh, it's like England, I love it, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and so I mentioned him in this poem and it's set in Kensington Gardens. And, and, and the epigraph is really not epigraph, it's just sort of, it could have been a footnote, I suppose. It, ex it explains what a linden tree is, like we all know, but Linden, any of various deciduous shade trees of the genus Tilia having heart-shaped leaves. And this is called Snapshots, Kensington Gardens. It's always a problem what to bring home after being away for a month. Something to say, I was thinking of you across 30 days and nights, 5,000 miles. Something to say, even if I've changed, I'm still me. Come home to that good place where we left off. The children are easier. A special book, talisman of a father's knowledge of their heart. A silly underground sticker for their door. Mind the Gap, or Guitar Case, Abbey Road. But this time, nothing perfect for you fell to hand, though I've certainly tried. Walking all across London, no tchotchke's been right, no earring just so, nor sweater you'd want to hear. Then, tonight, after a late dinner, I strolled through Queen's Gate into the gardens as Turner's sky cleared to a sunset rippling with gold. 
There were the swans in deep grass with their cygnets, the coot's nest as ever atop the cement pillar just breaking the water's surface. A Japanese couple trying to snap themselves with a swan, laughing as I took their camera and caught them together permanently. Then I stopped under the lindens where I thought of you, how with the children this scene has been ours in more than one early summer, how these trees, through their synthesis of light and air and earth, have recorded all this in their cells as a camera immortalizes a moment of light. And so I reached up and snapped off this linden leaf to press in my notebook and give to you with this poem. So, so, so uh, I used to go away a lot, my wife tells me. <laughs> when the kids were little, I wonder, you know. <laughs> and, um, and so this was a guilt poem, really, you know, about that. Um, and, I, and I promise not to go away more, actually. Um, I'm going to read in just a second um, um, some Valentine's po poems for Valentine's Day, including one. I guess that would have been a good segue because of the... But, but some Valentine's poems um, that begin in, um, in delight and love and end a little bit in cynicism. <laughs> but I'll read one more poem. That, that this one, um, written a few years ago, uh, it's one of a few poems that, I don't know, many of you probably write poems and things. Um, it's one of the few that I, I, I kind of woke up and uh, something happened, as you'll see in the poem, and then I uh, basically wrote the whole poem in a big mush. I mean, it wasn't in lines or anything. And then I was telling this to a student the other day. I actually was accepted by a really nice place, at Beloit Poetry Journal, which I really wanted to get into. And um, it was totally lined differently. Like, it took up one page and everything. And then all of a sudden, I looked at it and I said, oh, no. It can't be that way. And I rewrote it and made it long, thin lines, and it was two pages, and I thought, they'll never take, they'll tell me, forget it. And, then, and they didn't, which so I'm ever, forever grateful to them. But it was like, you know, you just, these things happen. So the, the suddenness of a poem, and then not knowing how to put it together, um, is really what this poem, it's, it's, it's secret story to me. I'll tell you a little later about other secret stories. Um, Oh, one more thing. A, a memento mori, re, you know, remember death. Think of those death's heads. I didn't know much about that till I was a young man and I was in Italy at the um, Villa Borghese Gallery in, in Rome. And I fell in love with Caravaggio. And there's a St. Jerome. And he has a skull on his, you know, and all of a sudden I understood memento mori. And so um, this poem is, a, and the other thing about this poem is that it's a genre poem. Um, every poet, Bill Stafford has a 3 a.m. poem, and uh, Vislava Zimborska has a 3 a.m. poem, an insomnia, insomnia poem, and so this is my version of it. Year 48, 3 a.m. Time of the newspaper's thud. The terrier growls, but still the body in the middle of the night is the one true clock. Reveals what few in the daytime would admit. I have learned to sit before standing, swing the legs slowly to the floor, for while the oblivious mind accelerates in an instant into time's passing lane, the flesh cannot so easily merge, cannot unlearn each second's dissipation of its stuff. Memento mori, who would have thought the death's head would be one's own self? No fresh-faced paper boy but night bird with cowl of black feathers that scratches till still tighter circles around us? The hours before dawn deliver the news. Mind finally hears what dog and body knew needed to tell. Halfway to the toilet, a strange yet familiar sound, an old man shuffling feet across carpeted floor. Yes, we may adorn our changes, tell ourselves stories of Ovidian splendor, but in the stark blue light, the moon gone with all its shifting dreams, we walk inches behind and can hear, if we dare listen, a scuffling outline, parched 
panting, not quite yet us. The, the, that, was the, that was the day I grew up. That was the, really, that was the day I grew up. I mean, I, 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 um, before we get a little lighter, can I do one more that's not so, because this one, it's a little bit more along the lines of, you know, like, who am I to you? Um, and it's, um, whoops, there it is, okay. Um, this one's um, a poem, again, moving it's toward death and then we'll turn to love. This one's um, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, just, you should, it, it explains in it everything, and I don't need to tell you. So, this is part one. It, it's about my dad, like, I'll say that. On the lips. In your last room at 3 a.m., my hand stroking your unwrinkled forehead, already almost cold, you moved your lips. I saw them move. Words passed, breathless words. I'm here, I had said, my lips on your cool ear. It's Herman. We're all here now. Your lips that insisted your three sons kiss them, though we grew gray, moved. You finally come. Now I can go. The other's hands on my shoulders. It's just a reflex. It was more. The morphine at first let you breathe, then stole your breath. All that surely happened was your lips moved. Two. You knew there was no life after death. Your brother at 37, brains dashed on Dubois Road, July 46, surplus jeep flung in the air and flipped. Herman, the English of his birth certificate, but high for the Hebrew Chaim to everyone. You shared a bed above the shoe shop in Newark. You promised if one should die to come back, talk, not leave the other alone. It did not happen. So you knew that what is here, um, so you knew that all that we have is what is here, that we lose everything when we go, though we go anyway, and sometimes nobly as you. I'm here, it's Herman, and then you left. Did you think it was he, his promise, good at last, finally come to talk, to take you with him? Or did you wonder, Herman, hi? Your face figured no question. It was your brother. It was your son. His breath, my breath, your lips, my voice, your voice. So, um, that's the... the Pretty serious part, I think. Let me turn to something that's uh, a little lighter and silly, in a way. Um, it's a poem that made, with some others, made a person say to me in a reading, and I was doing in New Orleans actually, that, uh, "Are you a horticulturist by trade?" Because I had all these garden poems, you know, and like I thought, "Well, that's pretty good." No, you know, I just planted a garden. But, but um, I was trying to write a poem for my wife for Valentine's Day a number of years ago, and it was. Um, I was trying, I wanted it to be smooth. Now, those of you who know Richard Wilbur's poems know how smooth Richard Wilbur is. He's, you know, he's just like, I don't know, he's wonderful. He's so smooth and perfect. And if you, if, I, I got to study with him for a semester once, and he's the only person I know who spoke in perfect sentences that were just balanced and beautiful all the time. And apparently he did it even when he was drinking. Um, and he's still alive, so he didn't drink too much, just enough. So this poem is about that. And the other thing is this. Um, years ago, somebody, not that long ago, somebody called me from University of Kansas and said, I'm just calling up poets that are in this magazine to ask if they put things in their poems that are just for them. You know, like programmers do that. What do they call that in a program? What do they, when they put something just for themselves in it? Easter eggs, Easter eggs right, Easter eggs. That's what the person was asking. And, and so I had never thought about this. And then I realized, yeah, all the time. And this poem had a secret in it that was supposed to be just so that my wife would know it and she'd kick me or something. It was that um, about the time that this was written, an article came out in Time magazine about how men are attracted to women because of, their, of the ratio of their wa waist to their hips. And so I called her Ratio Queen. 
And my kids thought that was really too much information, and you know, <laughs> they ran off and everything. So I was determined to embarrass them all. And to, I guess I was challenging, can I make a really graceful poem that uses a crummy word like ratio, you know, it doesn't sound good, you know, and, and all of that. So that's, that has nothing to do with the poem, which is about something else, but it was sort of the secret thing, and um, we're all nuts. <laughs> so this is for my wife, for Susan. It's called In the Garden Contraries. Today, contraries come to mind. I think of you, then words like negligee or dishabille lie loose and slink their silk across my face. But then I picture you, spade in hand, planting with a drop of sweat, pendant grace that glistens on your nose, tamping dirt to give a euonymous firm footing, its green leaves flaming yellow tips. Your biceps gentle curves, arms akimbo, hands on the flannel shirt hung loose from hips. And then again, your boudoir bound, dripping out of shower, towel wrapped, applying fragrant creams and oils, while I stand back struck by your ratio of waist to hips. Ah, it's contrast, not contradiction, and my luck. <laughs> so, she didn't kick me, she kissed me. She liked that one. So, um, you know, so, but you see, it's kind of funny because, you know, it, 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 how it's such a mystery in a way, you know, you don't, you start out trying something, and poems are all about discovery, aren't they? And the reading of them too. And in a way, the, the poet faces that strangeness in trying to say, where are these words leading me? What is this thought leading me, or this image, or this metaphor? And then the reader ha has to give in to the strangeness, you know, to, um, to the fact that every poem is by nature strange in some ways. And so uh, I think that for me to get rid of the willies of the mystery, to being, you know, scared by it, it's to have something weird like, I'm going to use the word this or do, do that as a way of deflecting myself from it. Okay, here's one. Um, that uh, I'd like you to, I've read it once in a different version before, but I thought that um, looking around and it wouldn't be, people wouldn't be embarrassed, but might be amused. Um, this is a poem, it's another love poem, um, but it has to do with the fact that uh, now, like uh, next week, I teach, I start teaching poetry and introduction to literature. I've done this like 75 times, maybe more. And I tend to, I teach a poem by Seamus Heaney called Digging. When he was in Portland, do you remember that? If any of you saw him downtown, he read it as the last poem because it's his most famous. And um, in it, he describes how um, his father or grandfather, his father would dig up potatoes or dig potato drills, dig plant potatoes. And he would, in his spade, would be levered against the inside of his knee. And so you have to see it in a way because later on in the poem, this is a spoiler alert, but um, at the beginning and the end, he talks about how he holds his pen. And so the idea is eventually, it's this visual metaphor, he holds the pen the way his dad held the spade, and that he's saying, I'm digging with my pen. You know, it's kind of neat. So I have a spade that I bring into school, and I realized I've been bringing it in since I first started teaching, which was going back to graduate school in 1974 the same spade, and now it's all smooth and shiny, and I have all these tools that are smooth and, smooth and shiny, and I don't know how it happened, you know, and many, you know, I have suits that way too, you know, <laughs> and I'm not kidding, I mean, you know, I can't, I can't remember the last time I bought a jacket or something, so, uh, but they, you know, they, well, the title of the poem is Falling Into Place, and so you're going to see, but it, it, I'm, I'm telling you, it's a Valentine's poem, trust me. But don't trust me. <laughs> Falling into place. Just what to, uh, sorry. <laughs> Just what do we grow old with nowadays? To what do we, I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm, I'm getting all excited here. <laughs> Falling into place. Just what do we grow old with nowadays? To what do we hold tight long enough for it to take our imprint, fit our hand? to wear and have been worn together until it hangs or hefts or rests with easy grace, so that holding is a falling into place. I think of tools, the hammer's handle smoothed by pressure points of hands, 
our ancient spade, the shaft worn slightly from our levering knees. The keyboard of this laptop, whose home keys shine from five years, tickling silent diction to release its secrets. Five years friction from needing words, from being needed, thrilled and blistered, toughened, roughed out, and then smoothed into something very new. And what of darlings? Doesn't all that rubbing, right and wrong, make them take each other's mark? if you grant them any kind of luck. Darling, be my keyboard, feel my friction, speak my diction, hold me your hammer's handle, your spade's grace that levered by your lovely legs falls into place. <laughs> I had to make sure everybody was over 21. <laughs> I thought we could do that. Um, okay, one more poem, a manuscript poem. N not really new, but one, uh, um, well, one more before that, and then we'll go. Um, this is uh, called, well, it depends on our all shopping at Kmart, uh, all right? It's called Blue Light Special. Um, and also, it, it's, it, you, it, some people here like jazz and know jazz, and Ben Webster was the great uh, saxophonist who uh, a very breathy saxophone. And uh, there was an article, I didn't find him until quite late, but there was an article in the New Yorker about him, and then I just fell in love with his work. And so um, it's referring to a song of his, there was a song that he played, a standard called That's All. And the, others, the other references will be clear. This is called Blue Light Special. Past midnight, this first snow's reflection bleeds moonlike through the blinds as Webster's breathy sax loosens its tune across our room. We're submerged in the stereo's blue glow, in this damp, delicious tristesse, her familiar fragrance already asleep in my arms, while I hold to wakefulness, savoring the moment's last chords as Ben brings home the sweetest rendition ever of That's All. Nothing else is. Ours may be an unstylish bargain, 30 years of married love, but compared to this, all ecstasy's gimmick, cinematic alchemy. Let others underwire beauty with silk from Saks Fifth Avenue, buy service from Nordstrom, novelty from Neiman Marcus. We'll simply lie here, bathed in tunes, the moon and blue light, special. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, um, I never have my kids come to these. <laughs> they just, they don't, even now, they don't get it. Um, so let me write, let me read you this poem then, and I'll end the love poems more or less with them. And, and you might leave, right, you know. Um, one time, a, uh, an editor wrote me from a magazine. It was, I'll, they ended up reviewing my book, which was nice, The Sycamore Review in Midwest in Indiana, Purdue, I think it is. And they rejected my poems. I sent them four love poems. And she said, this is the second set of love poems you sent. We love them all, but we don't want to publish love poems. Don't you write anything else? <laughs> well, I, I actually, that, that was a good help. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think, you know, love is pretty special. So this poem, I think, came after that. <laughs> so wait, wait. You'll hear the title in a minute. But I want to say that um, I'm also, I don't have a fetish, but I really like women's shoes. <laughs> and I've, I've written a, um, an essay, published an essay on women's shoes, a long one, you know, about the, mostly about the eroticized names for all the things. Like the opening is called a throat. Of course, shoes have tongues, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and so I was trying really hard not to write another damned love poem. And so I started this one, and, but as I said before, and the poets know, you don't know where your poem's going to head. So, I have sworn off writing love, is the title of this one. <laughs> I have sworn off writing love poems. I'll write instead of her workaday suede black flats, slip-ons with elastic vamp, spread like a fan of black starlings' oiled feathers, 
each a glistening thin rainbow, mid-toe to ankle, dark radii of color that belie the stayed cut and lowness of these shoes, shine wild light, the radiance inside her. Next, the polished leather pair, square-toed, black with short stack heel and instep cut on bias. The outside edge with two black hemispheres, so like the buttons, or are they studs, down the side of military tunic, drawn tight, containing and defining what's robust, bursting beneath a muscular incitement. And last, witches' shoes, her children call them, New buck, black again, pointy at the toe with open vampy vamp, pink flesh pressing through the shoe's heart-shaped throat. The heel is high for her, with pinched waist, like hers, widening again at base and rounded breast bulging forward, the saucery of Venave Roir, in her own modest way, of course. Ah, uh, what boast was this to forswear love? a hollow prayer to stifle what is beast and best. We don't write love. It is inscribed in us, indelible, always indiscreet. So, I mean, yeah, my wife thinks I'm 12. So I think I'm 14 or 16. So here are some poems um, about... Um, I guess you'd say they're about poetry or art in a way, uh, but also about ways of being and stuff like that. This one's called Letting in the Horse, and um, it, refer, it refers to the idea of the Trojans letting in the horse of the Greeks, the Trojan horse. And, uh, you know, the, I guess the, the Trojans always through history, and certainly in English history, looking back, they were sort of fancy pants people, you know, interested in fun and games and all that, not serious. Um, I'd rather be a Trojan than a Greek, even though they lost, you know. Um, and, you know, stealing Helen of Troy and all that. And uh, it, it has an epigraph from the English poet James Fenton. And this is what got me going because it was so startling. He's writing in a, he, write, he reviews art, and he wrote this about, um, uh, um, it's about uh, a story about the um, art um, dealer named Voyard. Of course, every artist is entitled to an odd way of working. If it works, it works. Vollard, walking along the street, noticed a horse being hoisted into an artist's studio. So the title of my poem is Letting in the Horse. Yes, it's letting things in the artist's work, which can exercise one's ingenuity. How to expand still more the already gaping doorway, or throw open the windows for all the light and air. Nothing ultimately will do but taking down the walls while somehow keeping a roof overhead. For some, letting in means getting out or in. Having traversed rivers waist deep, John Muir decided to undertake a study of the wind, so climbed a fir a hundred feet and in a windstorm's river swam. And then there's Henry Thoreau, who dug a cellar, planted beans, measured his and his pond's depth by taking the height and angle of each surrounding hill. What to make of Mary Oliver, throwing herself down cockamamie into every bed of grass and striding waist deep into marshes? Or Edward Abbey, belly on the desert floor, eye to eye with a crazed rattlesnake? They're Trojans who live and die for beauty, vain, courageous, selfish, yet large of heart, no matter that they know how it always goes, the open gates, the broken walls, raucous celebration, then to bed, where those who excel at plans and plots sneak in to slash their throats. There is no art without letting in the horse. So, I was trying, I wanted to try to end a poem with a statement rather than an image because Stanley Kunitz is famous for having told Lucille Glick, I mean, no, uh, Louise Glick, always end a poem with an image. So I thought, well, screw, you know, don't put beans up my nose, right? So I, so I, and I'm, that was the one that I was, I kind of was more satisfied with. Um, 
I, I plenty were were not didn't satisfy me in the end. Do I have another one here? Well, forgive me. I, I'm, what I'm trying to do is to think about what what would delight you in some ways. And um, how are we doing on time? Time. Oh, we got. We're good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. I don't want to. Be well, that's sweet. It's very kind. Let me read you this poem, and then I'll, I will read the one that's on, your, um, on the broadside. Um, this one is called The Hand of Silence, and um, there, it mentions two artists. Everybody knows Mark Rothko's paintings, especially if we're from Portland, since he grew up here. And um, I had had a really amazing experience. I went to New York to see, I think it was the the, uh, the Vermeer exhibit when it was there. There were all, all but one of the Vermeer paintings. I think there were only 19 or 20. And I really loved that. And then I went because at another gallery was uh, a Rothko. And I was complete, I always went, I went because I liked them, but I was completely bowled over by how good they were and how they made me think and how much I could sit there more than for any painting that I knew. And that was pretty interesting. Um, and then, um, the, the, so the, the Rothko makes an appearance here, and also the poet Emil Nolde. And if I had had my way, I would have had one of his, this painting that's referred to, just of the sea. He, he went and spent uh, several months on an island in the North Sea called Silt, S-Y-L-T, and he painted this, his seascapes, all these, oh, just the ocean. This one's called the Sea Bee. It's at the Tate Gallery in London. And I would have that on the cover of my book. But uh, we wrote them, and I wrote them uh, begging, charming, anything I could. I wrote them several times, and they, it was in his will that his paintings never be used for illustration of any kind. Um, so this one's called The Hand of Silence. Certain paintings engender stillness, actually take hold of you, not the other way around, envelop you in silence. Encourage quiet watching until that sudden moment when you see how much is going on despite what seems a simple passive surf surface. Rothko's cubes that speak slowly but with rich voiced harmonics at the lowest frequencies come to mind, as does a modest Japanese scene I own of some park and city haze that's all perspective a hillock foreground with thick pine trunk, then receding fields and trees, till finally, if you look long enough to reach some peace, a placid lake appears hovering in the distant mist. The tricks to, to look until the hand of silence twists how you've been thinking, till its acid sweat dissolves what's clotted up your hazing eyes. At the Tate today, Nolda's The Sea Bee speaks in dark, thick oils, tossing blue-black waves, and charcoal clouds shot through with yellow maze of light, so cold the white caps seem to freeze. On the Isle of Silt, he watched the North Sea's darkness solo for a month, Mostly black at first, more colors slowly, slowly ooze, as if just squeezed from tubes. We see no monochrome dream, but perception riddled with complexity. It's not dark chaos, but colors laid on, subtle connections, calming seas, clarifying reflections. The sun's yellow softens with orange, hatching. Nips the white caps too. Shadow clouds give off green from the sea. So that one I did end with an, end with an image. Thank you, Stanley. It was great. Um, now this this one is a poem that um, I wrote. Um, I was at Ragdale, this artist colony, and there were painters there and people composing and everything. And um, there was one guy named John Blosser, a painter who paints at a Mennonite school. He, was, he moved from Kansas to Indiana. I think he's passed away since. He had been quite sick. 
But um, John would go out at night with a miner's cap on or a, strap, a bulb strapped to his head and would paint scenes at night with the bulb strapped to his head. And there are a lot of things you could do with that. I think that that's still something I want to write about again. You know what I mean? That idea of being in the dark and painting with a light and all that stuff, you can imagine. Um, but for me, for some reason, I went back and I sat down in my little room that I have, my little studio, and I just thought about it. And I, I had this like revelation about um, darkness and how like a you know good bourgeois guy, I, I, I didn't like the, to look at the darkness and stuff, you know, like that. And so um, I wrote this poem for John Blosser called The Black Horses. I dreamt of black horses the clop of hooves following me at a distance under dim stars. It was dark, then it was noon, but always the horses. I turned and looked. They did not hide, but snorted and pawed, black hides rippling, black flanks flexing, black tails whipping to unsettle the flies. Patches of sweat further darkened their coats. Their eyes, dark hemispheres, settled on mine. Now it is morning. I am awake at my desk. The black horses are still here, but much closer. Their breath darkens the light wood of the desk. I do not look at the horses or touch them. I would like to, but that's not why they have come. They stand close, glistening. One fragrant head presses on my shoulder. The sweat-heavy leather, the weight of unalterable darkness. I will no longer forget the black horses. So it's become a kind of metaphor, you know, for me in some ways. Um, okay. Um, let me read to you, I suppose this could have been a, um, this is a, an odd poem. It was actually in the Oregonian some years ago when my family was in town. And that was really weird because it sort of seems like a bummer. And they thought... Many thousands of people are reading this bummer that you wrote. You know what's wrong with you? <laughs> those of those of us who have families know that our families think that a lot about us, right? Yeah. Um, th this one has um, two allusions that I want to tell you because it's more fun. I mean, normally you get it, but in reading it's hard. One of them is to the poem "Lita and the Swan" by uh, Yeats, which uh, uh, he he rhymes the words up and drop. It's a great slant rhyme. It's just one of those things that you notice when you live with that poem for a while. It's going to be important because, you know, um, the swan picks up Lita by the neck and then uh, plants his seed in her, and etc., and then drops her. And the other thing is that, uh, you know that Emily Dickinson poem about hope, some of you? Hope is the thing with feathers. Its perch is the soul. Okay. So I was sort of in not that kind of mood. And this one's called Hope. And it, it you know, I, I don't think my poems necessarily say where I'm from, really. But this one um, is definitely not a, a por Portland poem or a suburban poem. It's called Hope. Hope is a wise-ass hood bristling with knives whose craft consists of slipping his shiv in your side. The sidewalk surgeon who pairs the lobes of your brain, exposing your noodle's delusional nodes, is more painful than failure, not a blunt blow, but a longing that soars on gossamer, nothing but feathers. It's purchase the soul. Yes, it's silly, a goose, a grope to the groin that gives a quick lift, but lets you drop just as fast. Miserable Lita heard it when she trafficked with gods. A heart-lifting honk, calamitous crash. Yeah. You, you, want, you want me to send you to the doctor, they said, you know. That kind of a thing. I, I think of it as realistic. This poem is the one that's on your handout, if you, if you wanted to read that. I don't know if you'd like to read them along. Uh, or your, that there's a, uh, you, a broadside, you were you calling them? Or a, it's just a wonderful gift. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, and this one's called What to Keep. And um, 
everybody has a drawer or some place where you keep things that are precious and the things that are precious are not precious to anybody else, the things that are most precious. And so I have my father's glasses from after he died um, because when he was younger, he had heart surgery, uh, early heart surgery. Um, for uh, uh, He had rheumatic fever as a child, so he had to have a valve replacement. And uh, I always like it. He asked the doctor, how long is the new valve guaranteed for? And the doctor said, for life. <laughs> this was back. This was back when it was um, when it was really um, uh, that was really traumatic surgery. We're talking around 1970, I think. And so, um, so they were always, you know. So I thought, well, I'll have to write about those someday. And and then I was sitting. I was actually in London when um, I decided I, I got an idea to do something that I hadn't done before in poems. And so um, it suddenly came to to mind. What to keep. After the operation, after the casket closed, some, year, some years later, your father's glasses, which he had sent you through the hospital to find. Of course, the powdery, water-damaged portraits of great-grandparents, survivors of shtetl, steerage, hell's kitchen, kitchen, assimilation. A ball of road tar from a wooden bridge. Underneath, you'd seen a waterfall a pond, massive roots shadowing a bullfrog. Her sharper smell behind the ear when pregnant. Her true silence and that she forgets herself standing and lying, laughing. Photos of your kids now grown at two with yogurt on her face, him reaching for the camera, one together cheek to cheek at kitchen table. Don't forget your secret, nothing really. A fragrance walk through, chalcedony eyes, silver voice, posture upright like a dancer's, a nothing never had. What to keep is what's already lost, past having. A great circle having, a dream of stillness, momentary, meridian between imagination and memories, distant poles. So we think about that. Um, how about two more? Would that be good? OK. Let me find one I wanted to read to you. Um, before my mother died a number of years ago, she suffered through a number of years of, I'm sure hoping I can find it. Here we go. A number of years of um, gradual dementia. She was never, um, she never, she always remembered everybody. Um, uh, uh, and she would it was endearing what she would remember. It was something to do with um, motivation. I mean, that she would remember that I was when I was coming. I made it a point to get back there a lot to you know all sorts of machinations, and uh, she would remember. Um, and so um, I really lived with her a lot through it in a sense, um, from when it was just slightly showing itself as a kind of shyness in a woman who wasn't shy to much worse later on. And, and she was lucky to have moments of lucidity, too, so that was kind of nice. But, I, of course, it's something that you really think about. And I did this um, in the year that she died. It's called Mother's Milk. And there are two sections. One is 1954. That's the first. Whole milk in a bowl, snowfall of flour, powdered sugar, kitchen table tracked by little tires, a steel dump truck, red in the hands of an eager boy with stick-out ears and, like the mother whose hand turns and turns the bowl, adjusts the mixer's speed, tilts back its head so the beaters drip their sweet yellow mixture, a gap between his teeth. He looks up, brown eyes into hers. He looks in, he looks deep and long into the future. And then her contralto, such a serious look, Whatever could you be seeing? He lifts the bowl. He drinks, brown eyes still on hers, the sweet, the rich. He drinks, he drinks. 2007. Porcelain bowl crazed by lines mystics would scry, puzzling the whiteness. The surface no longer shines. 
There's milk, but the cream's skimmed, the remains thin, blue-gray, not rich, not sweet. There's no refilling this diminished bowl. Something's been taken half-baked, dispatched. Whatever is convoluted in the cortex of the self that makes the self, that sends the signals so that a person is more than a stew of urges, so that a woman is a mother, so that the milk in the bowl is white and sweet and whole. I drink it in, brown eyes that do not look back, the gap between us, empty table reflecting unambiguous light, appliances dark in the cabinets, pantry thinned to random cans, empty canisters, dust of flour, unremembered sugar. So, I think that my father would laugh to know that I write poems about my mother. You know, he, he wrote a lot of, he used to write doggerel and everything. So, uh, thank you for having me here. Let, let me read one more that is kind of a poem that's a love poem and also about mortality maybe, you know, sort of mix the two. Um, and this one, I wanted to see if I could write, you know, an obad is a mourning song, and they're often love poems, and I, I, I love Dunn's poems, you know, The Sunrise, I love those kind of poems, but I didn't want to be sappy ever since that editor, you know, said that. <laughs> I don't know. So I thought if I could start with an unpromising title, uh, how could I, you know, how, what could I make of it? And I, uh, I actually composed this poem on a very, very long drive and, re and refused to write because it would be dangerous, you know, and, re and did it that way. But now I don't remember it enough, so I have to read it. It's called Obad, colon, drooling. <laughs> and it's in two voices. It's all my, uh, my wife's a little higher. Obad, drooling. Oh, don't look at me, sweetie, when I sleep. What if I'm drooling? The morning light accentuates my wrinkles. Such charming self-effacement. Your murmuring, seeing me this way embarrasses even now. I say, good morning to her opening eyes, sunk in the pillow next to mine, slowly focusing on me where I have lain an hour, watching her sleep, composing lines on her composure. On the lines our life has drawn across her forehead, the verticals rising from her lip, the soft parentheses setting off each side of her at-rest mouth that was, it's true, open in the beautiful, dumb expression signaling real rest, <laughs> perhaps contentment, the deepest comfort. I have watched her face become itself over 30 years of mornings, wakening until I have seen myself in it as well. Don't mind my earnest gawking. How we remain opaque to one another. Yes, even now, as the glass once dark to our eyes, silverly mirrors each. It was I who was drooling this morning, who will again before long. Our images continue paling, and will pale until disappearing, one of us, and then our life. No matter how soft the pillow, how hard the morning light. Thank you very much for coming. So when, when I go home and I close my eyes and I, I'll think to my father, I can tell jokes, I can be funny. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't think I could. Actually, he probably wanted you to be a dentist. He wanted me to be a doc. Well, he wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor, and then it turned out he wanted to be a professor, but because of the... De he, he literally went to college in 1928. In 1929, the crash happened. He was a scholarship kid, first generation born here. And um, so he quit college. He wanted to be a language professor. This I found, he had mentioned, you know, 
maybe once in my life, but I found when I was cleaning out the house after he died, I found files to his language professors. He kept up with them years later. And he was a gifted linguist. He knew several languages. But, but um, you know, it was so funny that uh, he never told me he wanted to be a professor, you know. And so, in a way, I felt like I, I had um, lived his life in that regard. You know, I was able to do it because there wasn't a crash and everything like that. So, isn't that funny, you know? Yeah, Tom. So you're a teacher. Yeah. And how do you fit your writing discipline into teaching? Well, I'm a very slow writer. I'm 62 years old, and I have one book, and I have just a few new poems at any one time because I'm not disciplined. It's my own. Um, there are people who are very busy who write a lot, so it's just I'm slow. And at some point, I stop kicking myself, you know. And when I write things, I just do it um, as I can. But uh, so, so I do it. There were times when I was able to do it, like sitting in my office with the door open and people making noise and my children making noise and everything. I didn't read you a poem about my, uh, my son playing drums upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> but I have one, you know, about that. Uh, and, and so... Um, uh, so that that kind of a thing, I think. It, 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 I, I'm, I've never been able to just constantly write. I, I, I have times when I'm just, like, I'll write essays or I'll do scholarly things. And then other times when I, um, when I really need to write poems very badly and will take the time. So I'm hoping to have, you know, like, I'm saying to myself, one more book, you know, before I stop writing or something. You know what I mean? Like, I want to, some kind of goal like that. But I, I don't feel the same... Th- those of you who are near me, my age, I mean, do you, I don't have the same ambition in certain ways. Ambition doesn't drive me, but curiosity is all that I have left. Sort of, you know what I mean? And that's different. So that's that's the answer to it. You know? Can you talk? I don't know. If you remember the the line exactly? Was something about how your do poems tell us about where you're from or where what your place is? Yeah. And I have a sense from. Having listened to these poems tonight, that they do not tell me about your physical life voyage. They tell me that you really live in your heart, that you live in your memories and imagination and these things that come welling up. Well, yeah, I mean, it's true, but it, they have to be attached to things. And so that's right. like that. What to keep poems important for me is a sign of that, you know, that our lives are attached to the things that are in them. Um, but and I have a poem, I didn't read a poem that's sort of inspired by Kent State, that what happened in Kent State, and set in a place I used to go in college to hike all the time in New England. Um, and I have other poems about gardens and things like that. I mean, I was, you know, trying to give it a variety. Uh, but not actually place, and it stuns me. I, I'm so surprised. Is anybody else here surprised by her life or his life? How you ended up, in a way, or you know what I mean? <laughs> like... I never would have thought that I was, like, you know, when I was a, a student in college, this was like the crappy, sexist stuff, you know. Jane Austen was dumb stuff because it wasn't about, the, you know, Napoleon's wars and everything, like war and peace, you know, all that, that kind of stuff. And, and everybody disparaged, you know, that kind of stuff. And so to find out that I would call myself a domestic poet, that I write a lot about home and family, I try not to overdo it, you know, tonight, but... Um, that that's just where I am. And, I mean, there's all kinds of people and all kinds of poets. Today a student said, just before I came, I was in my three-hour class, which we I cut a little short, and we were t- they were reading poems by Jane Hirschfield, this wonderful poet, kind of a Zen poet in many ways, challenging for them. And so they were, one of them we were talking about, you know, was really complicated. And they had just read their own poems, several of their own, and... The, the, the beef that people had about two of them was they weren't complicated enough, was, you know. So then my one freshman in the class, who's this gigantic guy from L.A., he's huge. He must weigh 300 pounds, you know, and he's really smart and really cool and his own man. He said, can't, real quietly, he said, can't simple poems be good too? <laughs> and so I said, yeah, absolutely. And I said, I mentioned a few is that they should go look up some of Stafford's poems, which are not so simple, really. And I just recited a couple that I knew by heart. You know, the this is just a say by Williams, William Carts Williams, that sort of thing, uh, to show it. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about that, what we write about, and who and how. Um, so that so that's for better and for worse. I respect people who can write. In fact, my whole study of Alexander Pope, and I recommend that you go back now if you read him when you were a kid, 
and you go back to Pope's poems like Epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot, and you, which is sort of his, his um, argument you know, for his life, saying why, defending himself against critics, uh, to see his wit and to see how a poet can write about politics and culture and engage people. And that's what I loved. I was the 60s. I was when I started reading Pope, you know, and I wanted to, poets should be able to be involved in politics and everything. And then I greatly disappointed myself. I'm a home wuss, who, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, but that's fine, you know, and so there are poems of all kinds. So I mean, that's, that's, that's what I'd say. Anyway, thanks so much, all right? Okay. Yeah, good. Unless you, well,